All right. Morning, everyone. It's good to see everyone here. How many people are hungover? <laughs> Everybody. Okay, good. Well, um, we're going to have a lot of stuff to cover. Um, if you guys are ready, and we're going to try to blaze through as much stuff as we can um, so we can leave 15 minutes for Q&A at the end. Um, so uh, if you have questions, just kind of hold them to, to the end. Um, and if you could, please silence your cell phones. Uh, that would be fantastic. Um, so I uh, want to talk about uh, a lot of our workflow. You know, so we're Kite and Lightning. We've uh, been doing VR for about three years since the, the Kickstarter days. Um, we've done uh, a project, uh, a mini opera called Sense of Peso uh, that was based off of a, a short that Corey had been working on. Uh, we'd worked on Insurgent, uh, did a VR experience with uh, Lionsgate, uh, with the actors from the movie, and uh, we've kind of worked on uh, a GE project that Corey will dive deep into later at the end of the uh, second half of the talk. Um, and we wanted this talk to kind of be basically like all the secrets or all the mistakes that we've kind of uh, come across over the last uh, uh, two years um, so that, you know, we can share it with you guys and you guys could hopefully benefit from it. And, uh, you know, my personal pet peeve with a lot of these advice talks or postmortems is that they leave out a lot of the hidden context. Uh, so they talk about the very tip of the iceberg, you know, of like, here's what we did, and here's what you can see, and if you just do this, it'll be really awesome. Uh, and they completely ignore, you know, the context of everything that they did and all the things that took them to get there. So this talks a lot about the hidden part. Um, so we're going to do a lot of concrete, actionable steps, you know, and we're going to try to use a bunch of examples, um, and we're going to talk about kind of like high-level things and then um, dive into kind of specific manifestations of, of those uh, places. Um, we're also going to highlight a whole bunch of places where we think that we personally can improve and things where we want to kind of focus on in the future. So uh, how do we make stuff on a very small skeleton team? Um, what some people might not know is that Kite and Lightning is just two people full time, uh, me and Corey. Um, you know, we have kind of contracted out a couple of contractors and artists here and there, um, uh, but primarily full time, it's uh, just uh, me and me and Corey. So, um, the first thing that I wanted to kind of talk about, you know, uh, is kind of like our background to give you context of uh, who we are, where we came from. Uh, so you can kind of understand the rest of the talk in light of that. Uh, so Corey comes from uh, uh, VFX. He's been working in the film industry for 20 years. He's got, you know, two Emmys. Um, and he's, like, probably one of the smartest, most technically gifted people I know. Uh, so for any developers out in the, the audience, I always get a kick out of this, is that, you know, over a weekend, Corey set up a Linux server with MySQL, uh, uh, you know, on AWS, uh, and uh, to set up a uh, uh, confluence, you know, a, a wiki uh, tool that uh, we're starting to use, uh, and you know, did it all on his own uh, over you know 48 hours. Uh, and for people who are developers, you know, it's like a godsend, so, you know, to have someone that technical and that gifted to be able to handle a lot of that stuff. Something that you normally wouldn't expect out of, um, you know, artists or uh, people more on the creative side. Uh, my background, I started doing game development uh, back when I was a wee child, um, and then started doing graduate graphics at 18, um, and conversationally fluent in Max and Maya, started in the art side and then switched over to the, to the math side, you know, back in junior high. Um, and then the third weapon, this is our secret weapon, when everyone asks us, how do you really do all this stuff on two people, you know, all these crazy projects that you've done, uh, the reality is we just don't have a life, you know. So uh, what I put up there is uh, my time tracker for the month of January when we were in the middle of Insurgent. Uh, and so that was 305 hours clocked that month. And that month, I took seven days off to go celebrate my birthday in Brazil. So that's a week off of a month. Uh, so it's literally just working all the damn time, um, for better or worse. I don't recommend it, but that's the situation we're in. Uh, so next, we're going to talk about kind of workflow. 
Um, so here's kind of the, some of the things that we try to do at the beginning of each project to kind of help us uh, hit our targets. All these projects we've done are on like two months to three months timelines, uh, so super short on advertising schedules. Uh, so that generally means we have like one and a half tries to get it right. Uh, we can't do redos, we can't do uh, a lot of things, we don't have a lot of luxuries, uh, and especially with being two people, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's super constrained. So first thing we, we do is um, we try to, at the beginning of every project, is set uh, from the technical side, you know, triangle counts, shader complexity counts uh, from the beginning. Um, so that we don't have to kind of go back and redo any art uh, or get into a big performance crunch. Now, definitely, this is an area where we can improve on because, you know, uh, that's always kind of a bit of a moving target, um, and we haven't quite narrowed down on, you know, a set of uh, triangle budgets, shader budgets uh, that we can always rely on. It's kind of always a little bit moving, and it l depends on what we've learned on from the, the past project. Um, the other big thing that is super important to us is that we try to stay at near optimal performance throughout the entire uh, project. So uh, everything is running at 90 FPS from the get-go or 75 FPS in the DK2 days. Um, and that has been super critical because there's nothing worse than getting to the very end uh, of a project and being like, well, this doesn't run at perf uh, and we have to redo our or we have to just yank things out. Uh, fortunately for VR, like, that helps us, uh, being in VR helps us because no one wants to make stuff, you know, in like laggy VR environments. So uh, it's a bit of a godsend that it kind of just ha is this natural forcing function to make everybody put stuff into the, uh, to the project and into the game uh, that is performant. Uh, the big thing, the other big thing is that, you know, we've realized is that the uh, artist time, you know, is, is the most expensive long pole. Um, you know, we'd say that the, your creative inspiration is, is kind of limited, you know, even on these two months, three months windows. And uh, it's really important. It's something I've learned over the last two years. Um, you know, one example is that we had a, a friend of ours helping us on Insurgent, contracting for it, Keith Garrett, amazing FX artist. And in the middle of the project, we were, you know, creating some particle effects for, uh, you know, the, the, the explosions and the transitions. And I remember just seeing Keith spend tedious hours doing like data entry in Cascade and Unreal and, uh, you know, just fighting the tool. And I just remember thinking, you know, at the time I was like, wow, that's hours and hours of just wasted energy like that are just going away. And what that means is that that's just quality that's being left on the table. You know, those hours, you know, you, you don't get back, you can't work more, uh, you get exhausted. Um, uh, and it was just, it was a very concrete example of what happens when you have tools that you're just kind of constantly uh, fighting. So because artist time is the most important, you know, and the most expensive long pole, we kind of do a lot of things where we kind of, from a development side, thinking about maximizing the team's efficiency versus personal efficiency. So an example of that for us is try to do a lot of things in blueprints, um, even though it'd be a lot faster to code things in C++, because if we do things in blueprints, and if there's things that artists or designers want to change or modify or build on, it's very easy for them. If it's all in C++, even though it would have you know, taken me 10 minutes to do instead of like two hours, um, uh, then I become a bottleneck and I have to be uh, looped into uh, to, uh, minor things. Um, Obviously, it's a caveat. There's longer time windows. You know, development uh, time can definitely be the the long pole. Um, but on one to three month windows, uh, you know, we learn to be very cautious about making development be a dev bottleneck. Um, and an example for that, you know, we've uh, on Insurgent, we knew we at the beginning we wanted to do a big destruction sequence, uh, and we knew from the outset that. Um, you know, our draw call counts were going to be massive. You know, we wanted to have 10,000 flying objects breaking apart as the lab destroys. Um, and so we hedged our bet by, like, I started working on the tech for that, uh, our Alembic importer, um, during the tail end of the previous project before we kicked production into Insurgent. And so by the time the Insurgent project went into production, uh, we had the pipeline, you know, a good chunk of the pipeline uh, for doing destructions and importing Alembic into Unreal. Um, and we were able to kind of proceed uh, with a very hedged technical, technical risk. 
Um, and then another thing that we try to do is hire a bunch of people that are artistic, even on the technical side, because uh, programmers are lazy and very annoying uh, by like tiny things, and so they don't tolerate 10% of the stuff that artists, you know, tolerate. So if you have artistic programs and the artistic programmers, and they also do development stuff, um, they will fix stuff immediately, and stuff just magically gets better. I know every time I have to do something in Unreal, and if it annoys me, you know, just in small iota. Uh, you know, I try to go in there and, and code a, a workaround or, or a change. So that's always been a really big, big benefit. So next we'll, we'll dive into tools. Uh, and these are kind of some of the tools that I personally use uh, on my, you know, day-to-day -day, uh, workflow. Um, so we use, uh, we've settled on Perforce for the project source control. Um, we, uh, it's unfortunate, I don't recommend it, but it's kind of, it has really great integration with Unreal. Uh, even though we curse it every day. GitHub for the engine. Uh, uh, you know, we are looking into, at some point, merging GitHub and Perforce. Uh, but we haven't crossed that bridge yet. Uh, we don't have any continuous integration. Uh, unfortunately, it's on our list and it's an area to improve. Uh, we use Visual Studio, like it's 2015. I don't use Emacs or Sublime. Um, uh, you know, get a fast machine and get an SSD and, you know, it'll build in, uh, uh, a reasonable amount of time. Um, and then we use Incredibuild to help our compile times. You know, the, we definitely invest a lot of time in our infrastructure, you know, even though we're really small, because we don't ever want to wait on the computer. So our build times are like five minutes for a full engine compile instead of 15 or, God forbid, 30 to 40 minutes. Um, and then full recompiles are a minute. Still think it's a little too long, but it's, it's manageable. Uh, we use Slack for communication. Um, I use Workflowy. It's an awesome, amazing personal like note list, uh, to do list. Uh, we use OneNote uh, and Evernote for note taking. Uh, Box for storage, Excel for financing, and then ironically, we use Notepad to keep track of all our bugs and production task items, which is atrocious. But uh, sometimes you just need uh, a tool to get to get things done. Camera gear that we've used in the past is a 14 camera GoPro rig. Um, uh, it's pretty outdated. It was one of the things that we first used uh, to do like 360 live action uh, for the project, uh, like the voice. Um, and then recently we've used two Blackmagic pocket cameras to do stereo plates. Um, so we used on Insurgent to capture Kate Winslet and Mackay Pfeiffer and the other actors. Um, so now I want to kind of dive into the uh, team pedigree, you know, and type, the type of people that we found work really well with us. Um, and they are what I like to call T-shaped people, you know, experts in one specific area, but have broad uh, cross-disciplinary skills. Uh, so everybody has to be technical and creative on our team. Um, it, otherwise, it just kills our pace. Um, you know, Corey, uh, in our Unity days, he was writing C-sharp code for our gameplay. You know, on Insurgent, um, was kind of fixing some of the fracturing uh, uh, and dynamics on the train tracks at the uh, 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 third section of the, the experience. Um, and having people that are these, like, MacGyver types who can kind of do a bunch of things, but, you know, experts in one thing, means that we can do things really quickly. Like, that's how we get to quality, uh, to quality at speed. Um, you know, as a counterexample, we had a contractor that was, you know, a lot of two decades in the game industry, you know, pretty competent programmer. Um, but all I could do is program. And, and there was many times where I was like, hey, we need, can you test this uh, functionality for the gaze direction interactivity and just put a bunch of, uh, you know, levels together to test them out and have them move and... You know, he never opened up Max or Maya, and so, like, these really simple things ended up yanking me in to, to kind of uh, create stuff uh, for him. Or there'd be, like, you know, problems where, like, objects came in with their normals inverted or something like that. And, um, you know, uh, really simple fix to go into Max, Maya, flip the normals, fix the thing, but couldn't do it, so then it yanked either me or even worse, Corey, who's working on really important things on the art side, to come help that out. And that completely kills our pace. In a big AAA team or a big size team, it's not a big deal. You have a bunch of people who specialize, but we operate on a much smaller uh, team scale. Um, and a really example of someone, I think this is also really important on the business side, um, there's a really... Uh, 
awesome producer that I'm a fan of, um, who, you know, I don't know, 10 years in the industry, uh, is primarily a producer, and online right now he has this full-on tutorial on how to make a multiplayer UE4 shooter. You know, so those are the types of people that we find work really, really well with uh, with us in our our pace. Um, and it comes down to this idea is that VR development isn't like a bunch of people pushing a block. You know, uh, it's more like uh, a dog sled race. And so, like, what does that mean? You know, so it's more people doesn't mean faster. Like, more effort doesn't mean you're going to go faster, get more things done. It's actually quite the opposite. We found, you know, you can only run as fast as your slowest person. And our team is, you know, I think philosophically we're more like SEAL Team 6 versus Alexander the Great, right? And what I mean by that is, you know, we're super small, high, highly specialized, and can do a bunch of things. And when we add another person to our person, you know, our team and the way we work, it kind of slows us down. So that extra person has to be really, really valuable. They can't just do one thing, right? They have to be able to do a bunch of things. And that, for us, allows us to produce amazing quality work because you have people who can touch all parts of the stack. Um, and the other teams and the types of things that we want to do are kind of like specialized and we want, you know, we want small teams who work really well. We don't like processes. We don't like, you know, meetings. We don't like, you know, planning, although that's kind of bad. Um, but that's our type of team. And, and the other type of teams, you know, it's kind of like these great big armies, like the AAA studios, right? And so adding another person is just adding more manpower, right? Which is great. Um, so we've learned the hard way that some people might be really great and suited for one style of work, and, but totally terrible for the other, right? Um, you can be an exceptional developer artist, but if you're used to like an A studio and you need process and structure and someone to kind of tell you what to do, you know, like that's going to be, we found, cri like just not w crippling uh, in our work style. Doesn't mean that that's bad, you know, it just means just philosophically, like people have different work styles or work, like to work in different teams. And, you know, there's some things that we can't ever do on this small scale, right? Like some projects, like making Assassin's Creed 5 or 10 or whatever, is going to require a behemoth amount of work and a bunch of uh, resources, right? That, you know, a small team, no matter how skilled of 10 people, just can't do, right? Likewise, there's some things that we can do that, you know, a team that's of 100 people is not agile or fast enough to, to accomplish. Um, so now we're going to talk about rules of development, some lessons that we've kind of learned uh, along the way. Um, just kind of high-end philosophical goals. And so the first thing is that the most important thing in all these projects that is ship it, right? Execution is the most paramount thing from a technical and a creative point of view. You know, like executing on a creative side, you know, it looks a little different than executing on a technical side, but it is fundamentally the most important thing that you got to do is you got to ship it. You got to make, you know, you got to deliver your, your end product. Right after that is, for us, that I found is that making it easy to change. So all the projects we build, all the things that we do, uh, you know, the, it's really important to be able to change it easily. And the reason is, you know, I believe in creative endeavors, you know, either on the technical or artistic side, is that how long your iteration cycle is, is, is directly proportional to the final quality of your product, right, or the thing that you're doing. So, you know, if you're an artist and it takes you four hours to see a render, you know, out of like Max or Maya, like back in the 90s, uh, versus four seconds, like with all the path tracers that are today, you can do a lot more things, you know. Uh, uh, in the, the latter than the former. Um, so super important for us on the technical side. Uh, we try to make things small and local, uh, um, and we try to make things concrete and then generalize. Um, prototyping, awesome way to, uh, you know, settle disputes because, uh, you know, people can talk for ages. Uh, we love to talk uh, uh, ourselves. Um, you know, two examples we found of that is the, the snap turning 
You know, we, uh, there was, you know, internal debate whether that would work. Uh, it would be a thing that you can do uh, in VR, and it turned out to be really great. Another example was the stereoscopic video plates and uh, the stereoscopic plug-in. Uh, it was questionable, like, how well that would work. You know, uh, Corey whipped up a prototype and was like, no, it'll totally work. Put it on, and it was amazing, and, you know, we used that trick uh, a bunch of times. Um, and then uh, speed and accuracy is super critical. Uh, so uh, we use the analogy of like hill climbing, trying to find like the toppest you know hill you know on a plot of land. So I think you know speed is is how fast you are is that's your skill. Um, you know accuracy is like your experience. That's going to tell you like oh uh, like I know from experience that going in this direction is 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 the right way. Uh, I personally value speed more than uh, experience uh, because, especially in VR, it's a new field. So someone who can prototype something really quickly but might not ha have a lot of experience will try out a bunch of things really easily uh, and, and learn a lot in the process. And that's super more useful than someone who's have decades of experience but you know, it takes a week to do something like really, really simple. Um, finally, some things can't be done slowly. I think this is a really interesting thing that I've come across, which is, you know, if you send up a, a rocket uh, with half its velocity up in space, it's not going to take twice as long as it's going to uh, to get there. It's just not going to make it out of the atmosphere. Uh, it's going to take infinitely longer. And for software development, you know, this is kind of very antithetical to a lot of the advice that you kind of get for as a child. It's like, shoot for the moon and you land on the stars. Uh, it turns out that's not really the case, right? Um, software development is very non-linear, so you have to do things at a certain speed or a certain pace, or otherwise, you know, you'll never get to your end, uh, end goal. Um, the caveat, of course, is that some things can't be done, uh, can only be done slowly. So having nine pregnant ladies is not going to give you a baby in a month. Uh, so the key is figuring out when to know when to go fast versus when to go slow. Uh, we always use this mnemonic. Uh, I thought it was a very colorful quote that I learned from Corey uh, early on. And you know, he was saying like, if I need a hammer, and Corey's like the fastest person I know at getting stuff done. He's like 10 people rolled into to one. And everybody who, who does art and sees the work he does is amazed at how fast he gets to quality at speed. And I remember, you know, early on we were, you know, when we met, he was saying that if I need to hammer a nail in, I will grab whatever is near me to just get that done, even if I have to reach for a dildo. And I was like, all right, that's interesting. And... <laughs> And I thought that was really amazing because exceptionally driven people who are craftsmen, you know, like we try to do, we try to make things amazing and excellent. And sometimes I personally know that I try to look for the perfect tool, the perfect hammer, right? Like, oh, I hate this hammer is clunky. There's a better hammer that we can build. I focus on making the hammer really great versus actually focusing on the task, which is nailing the nail in. Uh, of course, the caveat is if you're laying foundation, right, it's important to take your time and build it at quality. So you can't make the skeleton frame of a building out of wood or straws. You need to make it out of steel bars, otherwise your house is going to fall down. And the trick is knowing when, uh, when you're, you're hammering nails in, painting on walls versus laying fundamental uh, foundational things. Um, so I'm going to skip ahead. These will be on the slides online so you can kind of read them. Um, and I want to get to uh, one last tidbit before I hand it over to Corey, is that it's very important to know that your creativity and inspiration is very limited. Um, so we work exceptionally long hours, for better or worse. You know, part of it is our personality, uh, but part of it is just necessity in these early days of VR. And I found, you know, when people ask me, like, how can you manage to do this, you know, I... I have an analogy that I try to tell to pe uh, people is that I feel like I have 15 energy hours in a day. I can work those 15 hours no problem, sometimes forgetting to eat lunch and dinner, but different activities burn you know, different rates of energy. So if I'm programming and it's good programming, one energy hour for one hour of actual programming. If I'm dealing with bullshit programming, like setting up frameworks, setting up this machine, fighting the build system, it's like for one hour of actual work, it burns like three hours of my energy, all right? Um, if I'm interacting with other people, if it's Corey or, you know, someone that inspires me, I might actually get energy back. Uh, if I'm, like, you know, managing or delegating, you know, maybe it's, like, two energy hours for every hour I put in. 
Um, you know, if I'm dealing with incompetent people, it's like four hours of energy, you know, uh, for every energy hour. So it's like three hours of the day working, and I'm like, I'm done. I don't want to do this anymore. Uh, I'm going home. Uh, answering email, business stuff, uh, that's, uh, you know, for me personally, the, the worst. P.S., if you like doing this stuff, come work for us. Um, areas to improve, we'll kind of get to that at the end if we have time. Um, I'm going to skip ahead. And finally, you know, take all this stuff with a grain of salt. Uh, this is kind of what's worked for our work style. We're very self-driven. We're, we have a very unique, you know, way of, of working. Um, if you, you know, we like people to just come in, do cool stuff, not meetings, not being handheld, mainly because we hate managing people. So we like people to self-manage themselves. Uh, if you expect process and, and procedures and project management, you absolutely hate working with us and, and our notepad style of keeping track of things. Um, but that's kind of how we work. And now I kind of want to hand it over to Corey to do a dive into the creative. Hey guys, how's it going? Everybody hear me okay? Uh, so yeah, I'm Corey Strasberger, the, the other half of the, the Kite and Lightning duo. And um, you know, I'm a big, big fan of making virtual reality. And uh, this is me, uh, a photo of me on a, on a good day, pretty much every day for the most part. Um, you know, I love uh, every aspect of, of creating VR, coming up with crazy ideas, world building, experimenting with new techniques, uh, you know, modeling, lighting, uh, texturing, animating characters, music, uh, programming, like all of these things uh, for me are, are things that you can kind of control and then harmonize into uh, a, a really wonderful experience that, that people get to go in and, and, um, and just feel awesome in, you know, and, and it feels awesome to make. So, um, you know, Krima and I have uh, been having a lot of fun over the last few years building VR, and we've worked with some really amazing clients on some really uh, cool subject matters. And so I want to start by walking you guys through the creative process that we went through uh, on our latest experience called uh, GE Neuro. And so it should give you a chance to kind of um, see how I approach VR ideas and then what's involved in taking an idea from the start all the way through to production. Um, and so across all of our projects, I think we've managed to pull off some pretty high quality VR uh, with a very small team in a very small time frame. And I, I think the ability to be able to do that on the creative side um, really hinges on this early concept um, pre-production stage. And so, I kind of dug through that process to try and find some of the, the gold nuggets um, of things that I think actually uh, are the keys for making that work for us. And so I'm going to go through that uh, towards the end. Um, but it's basically like this, this pre-production stage is kind of like, you know, uh, it's like going into a movie with a bad script, right? All the, the directors, actors, the, the best technicians in the world aren't going to um, be able to really save that movie. You've got to have you know, a good script going into a film. And, and for us, it's, it's kind of the same thing uh, with VR. So GE Neuro, this is a, um, uh, the client was GE. It was a three month long project. Uh, it's a seven minute experience that sort of centers around uh, a journey through the mind of a musician. Um, it was really fun. You know, we got to, um, we got, to, we got to talk to a lot of brilliant neuroscientists and uh, we got to go to Red Bull's facility in, in Los Angeles where they have like neuro training, um, you know, uh, facility for a lot of their athletes, which is really cool. We worked with Method Studio who helped us with some of the VFX. Um, we also worked with AMD who hooked us up with some of their, you know, their high power GPU cards so we can try to hit our 90 FPS mark. Um, so it was, a, it was a great learning experience, really awesome project, and I'm going to show you guys a just a kind of a hacked, cut down version of it. Has generously allowed us access to his brain, so we can experience firsthand what it looks like inside the mind of a musician. This scan of Ruben's brain, produced on GE Healthcare's MRI machine, will help us navigate through this experience, look around it, and take a peek inside. Before we take off, I'll mention two safety points. Be sure to stay on the platform, and you'll find it more comfortable not to move around while we're moving. Okay, let's get going. 
initiating miniaturization sequence. That was a little taste of um, the, the overall experience. And so GE's VR initiative was basically, you know, we want to use VR to take people into these amazing places in which we operate, right? Um, they're basically places that normal people wouldn't be able to, to go. And so one of those places happens to be, you know, the crazy, uh, the crazy complex world of the brain. And so this was our, our starting point for the creative process, right, to conceive sort of an educational yet entertaining uh, VR experience um, that was a journey through the mind. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through all the creative documents that I created during the pre-production stage of the project. Uh, typical pre-production process, it's very similar to um, a lot of other mediums like uh, commercial work and even film where you're basically just coming up with the initial concepts, you develop the, the chosen concept from the client, start designing based around that, and then you end up with a, a script and storyboard to sort of go into VR production with. Uh, as Akrima mentioned earlier, you know, while I'm doing a lot of this work, he might be, um, in the early stages, we might start to formulate some early ideas, and then he might start taking some of those ideas and, and kind of getting into the possibility of, of doing it on the technical side. And so they kind of overlap each other, and, and so far they've lined up pretty well for us. So this is, uh, we'll start with the initial concepts. This is usually just like, um, you know, trying to get a temperature gauge from our client, like, you know, what direction do we sort of want to go? Because the brain is uh, a super complex, really amazing place, and you can go in a million different directions, right? So I kind of go walk her through this, um, this kind of a presentation where I introduce like a, my overall creative thinking, like how am I going about all of these ideas? What's the inspiration? Um, and, you know, kind of led into this, this idea of a pilot episode. It's like there's so many different things you could do. It would be terrible to just try and only do one thing in the mind with VR because um, what I started to discover is there's, there's so, it's such a big mysterious place and, and VR is really the most perfect medium for actually exploring it, whether it's just creatively, scientifically, a combination of all those things. So I was like, why don't we make uh, a, like a pilot, just something that inspires people to go into the brain, introduces them to the idea of, uh, you know, the characters and, and uh, sort of the Magellan, the craft that takes you in there, and then we'll just do a bunch of these things. And so um, that was sort of the, the little pitch for that right here. And then I kind of go into a lot of visual inspiration, um, you know, just getting a sense to, of things that they, they like and react to visually. And then, you know, I just dive into the first direction, which was more of the, an epic, fantastical, beautiful exploration of the mind, um, musically driven. This is the, the end of the one that uh, we ended up picking. Uh, you know, and some reference images. So I kind of just walk them through the, the, the a basic idea. We we use a lot of references. Um, you know, this is this is um, an amazing piece from a guy named Matthias Mueller, uh, and was definitely the inspiration for the end scene of this project, where all the neurons were firing to to the beauty of the music. Uh, so there's a lot of those kinds of things. Anything that we can get our hands on that kind of represents the idea. Uh, the gist of the idea to the client uh, is, is, is sort of the process. Direction two, this one was a little bit more of like a, a human uh, drama story, probably would have been more live action, going in and out of different perspectives of people's minds. And then the third one was, uh, you know, the Red Bull collaboration. That was something that they put on the table early on. They're like, 
hey, you know, we know everyone at Red Bull, they're doing all this cool stuff, maybe we can go into the mind of an athlete, which is an incredibly awesome idea and something that, you know, we talked a lot about and wanted to do. Um, but we ended up picking the, the first one, which I was really stoked about. So the other thing we, we, uh, we talked about or presented was it was right around the time when HTC announced the, uh, the Vive, and uh, there was a good chance that we were going to be able to get our hands on it for uh, an early prototype for this project. And so, of course, we were, you know, static about the idea, and we're like, yeah, imagine, you know, you're in the brain and you can mani manipulate objects and all of this. So uh, we kind of presented that as a possibility. And then we had some additional ideas. Uh, you know, where you could take like an EEG and put it into the headset and, you know, people could, could paint things um, and, and their, their energy would infuse into the paint and then other people would combine and make this cool living art piece. You know, so this was kind of the pie in the sky part of the process early on where you're just like throwing out ideas um, and, and seeing what people gravitate towards. And then um, that leads us into, uh, so we chose the, the first draft, or the first uh, option. And then, you know, I go back into the, the creative bubble for a couple weeks and come out with um, what I call the cyber brain. And this is basically what, uh, if you guys have seen the, 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 pro the VR experience, uh, and you kind of got a sense of it earlier, but this is basically the, the creative brief that I presented to the client for the idea. Right, so I just kind of walk them through the, the gist of it, going into the mind of a musician, um, you know, just some drawings and sketches and trying to describe the scale of the world and what it would be like, some references for the structure of how some of the, the cyber neurons could look, you know, the nucleus. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of this in the process, just, just kind of getting the vibe of, of things early on. You know, the digital synapses, some lighting and shading references. And then, you know, the spirit of fun. What would the motion be like? What is going to, you know, is it going to feel like this fantastical thing when you go in there? And that was, that was the general idea from the get-go. And usually, we, you know, I'd end with like, all right, here's uh, the things that are to come still. You know, we'll get into the design stage and, and kind of, uh, you know, give them a little bit of a roadmap of what the next steps are. And then at the same time as well, you know, we knew we were gonna we were gonna build this sort of hover platform. We were really excited about the Vive, so we're like, all right, this this would be like you know the perfect thing because you'd be, um, you know, virtually constrained inside of it. We talked about even building this thing physically if if we were able to to do it with the Vive. But again, this is uh, this is me presenting to them the idea of it. You know, you could have all these integrated displays, holographic stuff all around you. Uh, the idea of being able to manipulate, you know, um, like brain scans and things and look inside them. This was the idea for the, the hollow host, the, what ended up being the, the Magellan head. Um, and along with the client, you know, I sent this document to um, a really amazing artist named Fausto Martini, who has done modeling for us before, a really talented guy, um, and he ended up modeling this, this contraption for me. So some of these references... Are, are more meant for him, just giving him some inspiration for like texture and shape and things like that. And then obviously some of the functionality that it needs to have. And then lastly, you know, we've all seen scripts and, and uh, storyboards, so I kind of cut a bunch out, but you know, this is where we landed. We've got our detailed storyboard in terms of what's happening, what kind of dialogue's happening at that point. And this, you know, takes you through the, the cyber world into the, to the more realistic neuron world. And then we're back into the, into the musician's loft. Um, so once all of this stuff's signed off on, then we're heading into full production, right? But what I want to do is rewind back to the beginning. Instead of going through the, and looking at like the results of an actual project, I want to talk about um, those, those key ingredients for us that I think during this process are, are critical for us to sort of be able to pull off high quality VR in a short amount of time. And so it all starts in pre-production. For me, it's this, you know, beautiful 
wonderful, serene place where you're just thinking of things, you're concepting things, um, and you're preparing for production. Um, and so here's three reasons why I think it has to be pretty awesome. The first one is that production is what follows, right? And so you're in this really great place, uh, this spatial place where you're able to juggle lots of different ideas, you're able to, um, you know, change fundamental things in your mind and then know all the things they're going to affect, right? So you're, you're, you're in a pliable place of creation, it's really awesome. And when you, um, when you go into production, everything gets really, really fast and picks up a lot of momentum, right? And so when you have short timelines, you can't, you have to be making just minor course corrections uh, in the production stage. You can't really be making major ones because um, uh, there's really just no space to be able to change things at that stage, like on a dramatic level. Um, so you don't want to find out that these things don't work out uh, in the middle of production. So again, you've got to do it in pre-production. Um, like Akrima mentioned, the 1 to 1 1.5 tries to get it right. Um, this is kind of an extension of what I was just talking about. It's, um, you know, you really just have to come up with a concept that works, uh, and, and a concept that works well in VR as well, right? So doing that means you're not, you're not iterating something in production uh, until it becomes something. You're, you're basically thinking up an idea in pre-production and then making it, right? So it's, it's just critical to get that pre-production stage right because um, there really are no redos or options for redos without just buckling the whole project. Okay, so shifting gears is slow. This is a this is a big one for me that I've just recently discovered or articulated in my mind. You know, um, for small teams, definitely for us, we, may, we, we wear a lot of different hats. And um, what I noticed with myself is that, you know, when I'm in pre-production, my brain's in a low gear, you know, I'm creating all these ideas and I have this ability to, to um, sort of formulate uh, what I think will work and, and why and, and all this, right? But when I shift into production mode, you know, I'm, I'm putting on my 3D hat, putting on my motion capture hat, my programming hat um, for shooting live action, you know, DP hats. And, and so it's like my brain shifts into a completely different gear. You know, my head's now filled with, with like technical things, you know, how, you know, um, how am I going to build this this city in insurgent in like three or four days? That's you know you know. So it's just like when when I shift into that space, it becomes really hard to to get back to that uh, that creative space and solve those creative problems. So it's key to to do that uh, in that time when you have it, right? Because doing it later is is tricky. Um, actually, let me go back. The the one of the things I wanted to mention was that. It's kind of like uh, on a set of a film, you know, there's the right way to do it is that you have a director and you have a cinematographer uh, and yada yada, and the director is not doing the job of the cinematographer, right? They have the luxury of, of doing what they do from the beginning to the end, and that's kind of a luxury that we don't have. And again, another reason why, you know, it's important for me anyway to, to kind of um, put everything I've got into that front stage because once I get into production, it's... Uh, it becomes a lot trickier. So, okay, great. Um, how do we make that? How do we make pre-production awesome? Or how do, you know? And so, six ways that have been working for us. First one is super simple, um, but really important. It's just give yourself enough distraction-free time. Um, you know, it's the creative space. Whether it's a few of you um, or just one of you, it's kind of like you need that time and space to to get down there where all the good stuff is, where all the ideas are and where you can kind of um, orchestrate what you think is going to be awesome in VR with, with sort of the, the, the story or experience you're trying to tell. Uh, go big with ideas. Now, this is something that might not be great advice, uh, but it's something we've gotten away with. Uh, so I'm just going to throw it out there. I think it's, it's worked for us. And that is like dive into ideas as if there are no constraints at all. I mean, we, we don't concern ourselves with technical aspects. Um, resource constraints, which are generally gigantic, 
um, you know, we just go there in our brain, right? Um, and the thing is, you really just want to focus on the story and the emotional content uh, at this point. Um, and to me, even if one of your ideas is, ends up being unrealistic, but it's a great idea, it nails the emotional content that you're going for, it's usually not as difficult to, to find an alternative. Um, you know, the key is just nailing that emotional component of it. Uh, so the heart and soul of the experience. This is something you want to find early on if you can, and you want to just spend a lot of time thinking, researching, writing, gathering references, and baking and baking on, on that core idea, and just you just let it evolve, and, and you're, you're constantly just sh shaping this thing. Um, it also helps develop your instincts. So the closer you, you understand this world that you're, this experience you're making, uh, it develops your instincts so that later on, you instinctually start making good decisions about whether something fits into this world or not. Uh, and that helps speed things up, right? There's not a lot of question to it. It's just like, oh yeah, yeah. for the most part, you know, um, it helps you iterate. It helps you look at for references really fast because you know immediately what fits into this world or not. Uh, and it also helps you, um, you know, Cream and I, we, uh, we get tempted in VR all the time. Like, we'll, we'll be, accidentally stumbling into something and, and we'll be like, oh my God, this is super awesome. We've got to just change what we're doing and make it this, you know? And so this, I think this, this heart and soul and really connecting with it helps you not just jump on every little like awesome thing that's in VR if it's not right for what you're building. So heart and soul questions to consider. Um, this is, for me, it's, it's a little ethereal, but it's sort of like, what's, what's the emotional spectrum? What's sort of the, the emotional slice of that spectrum that you're, you're creating within? What's the rhythm and pacing of the experience, and how do those go together? Does the idea support immersion, um, or does it break immersion, which is not a good thing? Is it, is it pure, and is it simple? Is it clear? Like, these are just some things that sort of roll through my brain when I'm, I'm doing this, uh, this stage. This is a really big one for me. It's another super simple but super and super obvious, but really, really powerful and I think necessary, uh, at least for our process. Um, and it's not so much imagining what will or won't work in VR, but more about what will or won't work for the, the story or the experience itself, right? So a lot of times people, I see people just, they have an idea, they jump right into VR. Um, and sometimes it's really cool just like they imagined it would be, but over time, as the other components start layering into this, um, they end up finding out that it wasn't quite right for their uh, for the overall experience. You know, so that's the stuff you're trying to eliminate, having to iterate in VR. Um, so, okay, what are we talking about? We're talking about um, you know, literally, if if it's a sitting or standing experience you're making, you just uh, you just sit or stand, and you imagine your idea just playing out around you in as much detail as you can, imagine all the feelings you can. And, and this is sort of an evolving process, and so you want to follow the feedback of, of, of that, right? And, and you want to keep doing it a lot. This, this works for me really, really well. I just kind of go through ideas. I imagine all the different things uh, in, in real time, and it's a really powerful tool. Um, Pacing, it's also a really powerful tool for pacing, right? So literally grab a stopwatch, um, go through the scene in your brain um, in, in all the detail, and it's sort of like, you know, if, if the scene feels really good, all the things are interacting and, and, and it clocks out at three minutes and your experience is like three or four minutes, that's generally not going to work, right? Um, so you don't want to find that out after you're already in VR land, because once you start cutting things um, that, that have the right emotional pace or compressing it, then you're really losing stuff exponentially, and, and you don't want to do that, you know? So I think we're getting pretty close. I'm going to start speeding up a little bit. Uh, I was going to give you guys some examples of, of visualizations that I do, but I think you get it. I mean, the big key is just spend a lot of time doing it and, and, and get good at it. And, and you'll start to see how, how strong it is as a, as a means for 
uh, I think eliminating a lot of just paths you could easily jump down in VR and, and just try to do. I mean, if you have time, that's great. Um, another thing is uh, organization. So I'm a crazy person for organizing things. I always have been uh, in, my, in my digital world, definitely not in, in real life, but in my digital world, um, my Maya scenes, um, you know, everything in my space is super organized. And when it comes to production and, and having lots of uh, assets and elements and, and things that you're putting together over long periods of time, to me, it's so critical to organize as you go because if you don't, you start to get into this place where you, um, it's, it, it, it literally starts draining all the, the stuff that you wanted to be able to do in the end, right? So we're, we always have these things that we're like, oh, if we have time, if we have time, or, and a lot of them for me are like, it's not even if we have time. This stuff has got to get in there somehow. And I know the only way that that's going to happen is to be able to not be fighting the mess, some kind of a mess that we've made over the course of the project. Um, and I can't stress this enough. It's, you know, so whatever, whatever you got to do. For us, uh, or for me, the, some of the software that I've found that's been really awesome at that is uh, Curio uh, on the creative development side. It's uh, Mac only, but it's super awesome. You know, I create all kinds of, like, you know, lists. This is you know, some snapshots from, from the game we're working on right now. Um, but it's, it's a free-form layout program. You know, I dump ideas in there. I, I make lists. You know, I'll just kind of, like, figure out. Uh, it's just like a space where I can lay things out and ponder ideas and things like that. Really cool project. Uh, really cool program. This is uh, part of Neuro. You know, I'll, like, break down the worlds and... and um, get into just smaller aspects of it, think, think them through. Sometimes I print these things out and, and give them to people that are working on it. Uh, the next piece of software, which was a relatively new discovery, super awesome. Um, Krima mentioned it earlier. The this program called Confluence. It's basically just like a, a web-based wiki that uh, I, you know, I was inspired by Unreal, the Unreal engines. Their documentation, I think, is really, really good. Uh, you know, they're organizing a ton of information, and, and so I like the way it was laid out. I found something similar. This may even be what, what they use. You can customize the hell out of it. It's super cheap. Um, for our earlier projects, I don't know if, if this would have been as essential, but for our game, the, the list of, of things is astronomical. You know, all the systems that we're building that all have to intertwine and work together um, all of the characters have like zillions of different options. There's different modes and states. And, and so for me to be able to harmonize all these things, uh, it, it kind of goes out beyond the limit of what I can just hold into my brain. So this became this sort of place that as I'm jumping into a, a section, I have access to all these things that I can't quite keep in my mind. And so... The idea here is like we're, we're starting to organize all the, the systems and rigs and, and the, the lighting rigs, the, you know, the, the, the vehicles, the characters, the effects, everything basically that's, that's going into the game we're making is sort of solidifying in this place. It's not much of a write down some notes and ideas. That's what we, we do in different software. Um, but it's sort of solidifying uh, the things that we're designing. And it's really good for it, you know. Um, this is just some of the level activation states. Uh, so I guess uh, I'm just going to wrap up, and we're going to do some Q&A. And uh, this is Krima's end, end slide. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Oh, you know what? Sorry, I, I want to mention one more thing, because when I jumped into making a presentation, I just dumped a lot of really cool stuff that didn't make it. Um, talking about motion and, and spatial, uh, how to deal with space in VR, and, or how we've been dealing with it. And I've got a, a bunch of cool blueprints that I want to put online. So if, uh, if you guys are interested, there's a, a lot more stuff that I'm just going to start dumping onto our blog that kind of came out of, uh, you know, putting things together for this presentation, along with, like, a lot of techniques, right? Like projection mapping, something that's really awesome in VR because 
you need that dimensionality. It's, it's really easy to do depending on the subject. So I have a, a bunch of uh, in-depth sort of um, looks into how we've used that on projects. And um, uh, stereo billboard, the, the stereo billboard effect. And uh, there's a few more. So anyway, check the blog. There'll be some cool stuff coming over the next month, I think, um, that might be interesting to you guys. Cool. Thanks, guys. So we have about five minutes. Uh, we kind of ran over for questions. But if you have any questions, feel free to pop into the mic. And we'll stick around after the talk for, for a little bit. Yeah, I have one over here. Yes. Uh, yeah, hi, I work for a company that also does uh, VR work for clients, typically three to four month timelines. And sure. we found that kind of talking with the client to get budgets and timelines in place is a bit difficult because there's so much experimentation and so much kind of outside the box stuff that people really haven't done a lot before. So when trying to figure out a budget and a timeline, do you guys have any general advice for that? <laughs> you know, it's business stuff, kind of hard to talk about sometimes, but... Uh, we, I mean, kind of basically, we started winging it, you know, I mean, um, the budgets from, like, commercial world to VR is obviously vastly different, um, so, you know, in the beginning, it was kind of very much, uh, uh, we were kind of just kind of winging it, and then as the projects kind of developed and gotten bigger, um, uh, we were able to kind of parlay what we've done before and use that as kind of a baseline, um, you know, so I feel like we, we do still do a decent amount of experimentation on every new project, but um, uh, we've been also fortunate enough to have a lot of clients who've trusted us and been like, you guys have been doing VR, you guys are going to make something awesome. And so when we throw crazy ideas at them, you know, generally they're like, okay, all right, okay, go ahead, you know. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Hello, uh, thanks for the insightful talk today, guys. Um, I have a couple sure. questions. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what your physical workspace looks like um, and what, <laughs> what maybe the, the ideal streamlined VR workspace looks like? Um, <laughs> you would I take this? Sure. <laughs> um, Mine is horrendous. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you're talking about, like, desk space, yeah. Um, yeah, his is horrendous. <laughs> but uh, right now we're actually, we're, we're working out of Paris. We, we moved out there last summer just for, we wanted to just do it for a block of time to kind of get away from, from L.A. And, and be able to focus. So we, we started in a, in a shitty little apartment that, um, we, you know, we had our vibes and all these things that we, we were trying to stick into this small spot. And it was, it was pretty terrible. So we, we ended up with a, a pretty big space um, and it's it's honestly super awesome for VR because it's we both have this huge contiguous square space and we could set up you know a big area. The funny part is we we've been there for about I don't know four or five months now and, and we haven't we haven't even I haven't even set up anything on my end because our, our the thing we're doing right now is a, a sit down. Um, but I'm not exactly sure if that's answering your question. Um, it has, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, you just for me, you just if unless you need that space to to be able to build an experience that you need it for, you know, you just need a desk and a computer and your headset. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. yeah that, that. There's like 20 cups of coffee on mine and coke cans <laughs> and things like that. My my desk space is horrible. Like nasty stuff. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Hey, you're welcome. Um, I was just wondering if you um, had any more insight on your choice of uh, develop or, uh, knowledge management tools. Like, I think it was, what was the Mac application? Curio. Curio mm -hmm. and uh, Atlassian, of course. Um, what was your journey to getting there? Man, it's, it's, you, we all know how big of a pain in the ass it is. I'm, I'm, I'm looking for software constantly. And uh, even a long time ago, I ended up just writing my own software because I couldn't find anything. And that turned into a year-long thing, you know? And I, that journey for me is still going on. I'm still trying to find uh, things that are great and filling certain things. Um, you know, Curio, I stumbled on. It's been around for a long time. I stumbled on a long time ago. It's actually starting to get worse now before it's getting better, which is tragic to me. Um, uh, and, and then Confluence, it took, it took a lot of research. I was, like, looking at a lot of different things, and I was about to settle on some stuff and then I came across it. It's, it's weird where, where these things just live in, in the internet, you know? 
Okay, I think we have quick time for two more questions. Uh, go. I um, was wondering if you can quantify uh, your choice of using Unreal over Unity. Uh, I'm, I'm, a fan, I'm a fan of Unreal, sure. but uh, always wondering, you know, what would I say to someone using Unity? Uh, why you should use Unreal instead for that? I'm, I'm going to take this one. <laughs> <laughs> so this is how we this is how we decided. Uh, I've I've been a huge fan of Unity. Uh, it was all I was using as a game engine early on, uh, and there's just in my mind there's a lot a lot of things you could do with it. And then one one day I walk in the office and Akrim is like, "Dude, we're switching to Unreal." And I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, oh, this does not sound good. I just started getting into Unity. Like, I like it. It's a great piece of software. And, and the reason was, he's like, dude, I, 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 they just released it. It's, it's pretty much practically free, and I have source code access. And for us, it's been gargantuan, because it's the things that he can do and has done with that source code access is just, like, blows my mind. Like, we literally, before, like, in Unity, we'd hit walls that we just can't get past. And with Unreal, there's literally nothing that we can't do or that he can't make it do. And for, for me on the creative side, it's, it's a dream come true, you know? You're, you're using Blueprints though, right? Like you're not using C++? C++ um, or, I'm or, using or, Blueprints. He's definitely yeah. using C++ and he's, he's excited about that every day. <laughs> he's like, oh my, you know, he, he, he struggled with Blueprints for a while and still does uh, for the sake of everybody else, but his, his, he's definitely in, in C++. Cool, thanks. Mm -hmm. yeah. One last one. Hey guys, Alexander Mejia from Human Interact. Hey, Alex. <laughs> hey, uh, just a quick question. When do you decide to uh, build a tool versus, you know, try to talk to someone at GDC to help make you something? Uh, what, do you, what do you mean? Like building tools versus, like, trying to talk to partners to be like, hey, could you ship this tool to make it more, mm. you know, to our workflow? Oh. Um... So an example would be what you know, hitting up Unreal and being like, "Hey, can you guys add this?" Mm. versus us just adding it. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. We've, uh, I mean, we have a good relationship with uh, Nick. Uh, you know, we're at the other room, both Nicks. Um, Epic's been amazing. Um, uh, mm -hmm. You know, and they've gotten a lot of like uh, good, you know, feedback and back and forth. I think for us, primarily though, we just build it ourselves because we're just on a, such a short timeline. Um, one of the things I left out in the talk was that you know. Uh, on two months, three months time windows, you know, we definitely try to buy the tech first if it's available, because um, building it in house, you know, being one person in charge of all the the technical stuff, um, you know, it, it's a it's a big time suck. Uh, but generally, that comes with a very big caveat. Like Bink, for example, uh, is a video codec that we used on Insurgent. Uh, it's an amazing codec done by like super smart, genius people, uh, it was the biggest fucking pain in the ass to integrate. Because they <laughs> are used to, you know, it was, it was one of the hard lessons learned, they're used to dealing with, like, game companies. So they're on the enterprise software scale, time scale, where, like, a game is taking two years to make. So they have time to integrate it, where we're like, I need a plug-in, you know, drop-in that I can just put in and we'll be ready to go. Um, so generally, we've kind of just built everything ourselves. We built uh, the Alembic importer for the destruction sequences. Uh, we built our stereoscopic, you know, export tool. Um, and then a lot of tools that we, I feel like, are coming down the pipeline, you know, we kind of just wait until they come in, come in, even though Corey, like, wants them, you know, yesterday. Like, <laughs> editing in VR, for example, that was a, a big, obvious one that we really wanted, but we just waited until Epic did it. <laughs> Yeah, sort of. <laughs> I actually built a really cool but very sketchy uh, thing that allows you to edit inside VR. And it's also true, yeah. yeah we, <laughs> so we did, the Corey built a stop. Benefits of having someone who's also very technical. You know, he'll just build it himself. Uh -huh. Awesome. All right, I think that's, uh, we're out of time. So thank you guys very much and uh, enjoy the rest of your talks.